the grades are, the, the answer keys are here, so. Um, you didn't pick up yesterday. If you have any problems, talk to me soon. Um, it's always easier to work with you now than at the end, right? Um, there's nothing I can do if you if it's the last day of class and you are falling behind and stuff, right? So, um, okay. So today we are reading a paper on resource containers, right? How many of you found the paper? How, how was this paper compared to the last paper? Was it a little easier, a little harder? About the same? Hard to follow? Okay. I thought it was easier to read. I, I, I thought it was easier because as the, 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 the newer the paper is, they follow more of what I kind of say at upfront. You know, they, they, they are much more regimented on, on where things go and what things happen and stuff. The older it went, it was more free flowing. They kind of <coughs> didn't, were not constrained to be whatever they were. So these papers, I think the newer papers are easier, right? Um, Whatever, right? So, what is this paper trying to solve, right? Something with processes, something with, with this kind of a stuff, but I think it's a little different than the two papers we looked at earlier. The continuations and, um, and schedule activations were looking at a different problem. This is looking at a different problem, an equally important problem, which is kind of not considered much by operating systems. Um, it's considered a problem that you must have been taught in undergrad, though, it's likely that you never spend more than a few seconds talking about this, right? So what is this paper trying to address? Obviously it says in the title, right? It's trying to do something with resource management, right? So one of the, the earlier things you, you learn about operating systems are operating systems are a resource manager, right? If you, the undergrad class would have told you that operating systems manages resources, right? If you haven't heard it, that's one of the things that they, the, the basics they say, you know, it, it manages resources. And can you give me examples of resources? Disk. Disk. CPU time. CPU time. <coughs> Memory, right? And another resource that this paper looks at is networks, right? So there are all these resources and the operating system manages these things, right? So what do you, what, what does it, what, how does the operating system manage these resources? What is the typical way it manages these resources? There's no trick question, it's a basic um, basic question, right? How do you manage CPU? Schedule. So you schedule, right? So you give some CPU to somebody, you take away some CPU from somebody else, what have you. So that's, scheduling is the, is the basic way you do your CPU, right? So when are the, what are the conditions under which you schedule a process? What is the different conditions which make you change something? So if you give a CPU to some, somebody, and if you want to take it away, what are the conditions under which you do that? Give, give something and take away something. So when a, when a old process changes some state, right? It finishes I.O. or something and it's ready to go, right? So it couldn't run before, now it wants to run. So I can, so that's a good point for me to give it some resources, right? Or the converse, right? It couldn't run because it wants to I.O., so I stop it, right? So I stop processes which, which voluntarily do something for which I can't give it any more process. So if you want to I.O., the OS can do nothing but take away the CPU from you because you're doing I.O. And when you're finished with I.O., you're saying you're ready to go, right? So those are, those are one type of events where the, what happens is driven by your program, not by the operating system, right? You, you call I.O., so you give up your CPU. You finish I.O., then you say you're ready to go for a CPU, right? What are the other conditions where you um, manage your CPU? Where you give or take away CPUs? Yeah, 
Yeah. So some yeah. So the other time is involuntary, right? He don't want to go, but I decide that something, right? I decide that you've been running for too long. Then I say, okay, I'm going to take it away from you, right? I, I preemptively take it away from you because you've been running for too long, right? So that's the two kinds of stuff you do, right? Your program itself drives what you want. And for that, we don't have to maintain any data structure because that's what your program wants. If you want to go for I.O. all the time, then be my guest, right? But the other case is I want to keep track of the other resources. And if you're doing something more or something, I need to step in and enforce the notion of fairness, right? Operating systems try to be fair. The definition of fair is not precisely simple. It's not simple, right? I mean, it can be based on how important some things are or what have you. But the essential idea is it's trying to manage all these requests from different processes and it's trying to make sure that each of them get some amount of resources and let's call them fair. So if you have an important process, the fairness may mean that it has to get more something. And if it's less important, it will get less. But it's trying to balance all the stuff. because it, So if it has enough CPU resources for any possible combination of processes, then life is good. But that's not the case. We have resource constraints. So we have to figure out how much to give to somebody, how much not to give to somebody else. right? That brings up the issue that this paper addresses, which is figuring out how much resources you're using. right? So if I know how much resources you're using, I can be fairer. If I don't know how much resources I'm using, I can't be fair because you can basically try to sneak away resources from me because you are, I, don't, I don't keep track of something, right? So how would you keep track of how much CPU time you have used as a process? What to say, how, how, how do you typically do that? This is, this is one point that you might have heard in undergrad class, yeah. Isn't it the, the, the kernel keeps track of that and the process doesn't really have any way? Yeah, but how, how does ask, the... Do you ask the kernel how much time you've no, how, how does the kernel keep track of that? Does it just kind of... Doesn't it maintain something in the, in the schedule? Mm -hmm. But how, how does... I'm saying how, do, how does it measure that you have used X amount of CPU? You count clock cycles. The scheduled clock cycle, right? So it, it doesn't have to keep track all the time, but you can say, I gave you the CPU at time x, right? And now I'm going to come back at time y. The difference is the time that you use the CPU, right? As long as CPU is assigned to you, it's being used by you. So I can keep track of how much CPU you're using by, so every time that the, the scheduler runs, right? It gives you a process, and then when it takes it away because of IO or whatever, it figures out what's the time difference, and it adds it to your something in your process control block, right? For each process, each thread, or, or whichever scheduling unit you want, you can keep track of those by keeping track of how much stuff was given to you. And it can do a fairly decent job because it knows that if the CPU is assigned to you, you get charged, right? It does not matter what it, as long as you don't do IO, in which case I get, uh, operating system gets involved, you can do important stuff or you can just go in a uh, while one loop, but still you get charged, right? So that's, that's one way of doing the stuff. So that's an easier, easier way to kind of charge the right person for the right amount of time, right? The, the problem comes when there are other kind of resources where the charging cannot be done so easily, right? One of the things that they talk about is the notion of network processing, right? So when you have a network processing, they show cases where it's not really clear where, where the processing happens, right? So the, the reasons are, there are some things that are being done on your behalf by the kernel, right? And usually it's not charged to you because it is a, it's a very complicated stuff, complicated, and, and they show some of it, but in, in general it's a very complicated problem. There are some cases where no one knows who it belongs to, and then they also don't get charged and, and the problems that they cause, right? So let's look at the case of where, what you do inside the kernel is, is, is causing your stuff, right? And, and this kind of relates to what we did with the, with the um, microkernel, exokernel, and, and, and all those things, right? So what are the work, kinds of work that the kernel does for you that um, you benefit from? You as application benefit from some things that the kernel will do for you, right? How do you get those services? A system call. 
yeah, system. When you make system call, you kind of go off and then you do some things. And whatever the kernel does for you, let's say simple operating systems don't account it for you, right? So that means I can write an operating system where all I do is make system calls, and if the, if the operating system is powerful enough, right, it'll do all the work for me. So I don't get charged. So it looks like I'm, I'm, I'm not doing anything, but I'm still getting all the work from the system, right? So you want to prevent me from doing that as compared to somebody who's doing all in user space, right? So can you just put, take the time it takes for you to, uh, to service a system call and charge it to me? Because for the process, we said one way to do that is when, you, when I schedule you, when I deschedule you, the time be between those is the time I was given to you. So can I look at the time between when you made a system call, return from a system call, and charge it to you? Yeah? No, no because there's I.O. or something that has to happen in the background then. So that's the excellent point, right? So the, the issue here is when you do asynchronous stuff, right, which is what IOs are, right? So if I say read block, right, the system call may return much faster, or, if, or, or Converse lets look at write call, right? When I say write a block, system calls don't wait till the, the data gets written on the disk and you know the, wait for the arm to find locate where it is, write the whole down thing and come back. It kind of comes back to you when it's something is scheduled, right? So operating system is going to continue to do something on your behalf, and it's very hard to do that because all all it happens is, let's say this is your kernel, right? And you do a write system call, right? So basically, at this point, it puts it into some buffer. It, it's going to say somebody wants to write this, and there's going to be some other buffer is going to be written. So inside the kernel, somebody is going to eventually take this from here and write it to the disk or what have you. So this cost involved throughout the system, and you can't just time the time between the system calls. You need to kind of track these things down, right? Is it easy to track this down, or is there something uh, tricky here? They didn't explicitly talk about this particular case in the paper, but. This is more of a policy versus mechanism issue, right? Think of thinking of the policy mechanism debate. Do you think that charging it? So is it? So you could do the same thing, right? You can say, I want to write this this particular block, right? <laughs> and this particular block belongs to this process. So when I get around to write it, I'll charge whatever it took for me to this process, right? What, do, what is involved in doing that? The answer is in the policy versus mechanism stuff. Yeah? So it depends on the policy, right? I mean, if the OS decide to have the right buffer, mm -hmm. then it has to wait until, you know, let's say, like, you know, you have, like, 10 buffer to write and it write. Less than 10, it just wait. So when it's write, it's got 10 buffer. Mm -hmm. I only write one. Mm -hmm. One one buffer, so then, you know, how do I catch up with that? Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to separate between, you know, which process do I want and so that's an excellent point, right? So one of the problems is, you're, like at this point, you're doing something for the global system, not something for your process, right? So if I read you correctly, I can decide to write 10 of them all at once, right? Which will be more efficient, right? And how do I charge that time to do it to the appropriate processes? Is that, is that your point? So you're doing another decision, another set of uh, mechanisms here, which are going to optimize something, right? So the net effect of that is your operation may cost differently depending on unknown parts, right? So if it was able to kind of amortize the cost over a lot of writes or reads, then you may be charged less than if you are the only one who has to go, right? Right? So if, if, if I can write all 10 in like one or class of one, so you get only charged one tenth, right? Is that a bad thing? Because, yeah, because the operating system only took one tenth of the work, right? So it, it's, it, it gives unpredictable performance, right? But it may be okay, right? 
On the other hand, it may actually take you twice as much resource because of whatever it's doing underneath. And you have to, so over here, you have no idea of knowing how much resources you need to do something because it depends on what the system decides to do, right? So that's one important problem and, and that, that's, that's something that you have to deal with. What's the other problem that, this paper also touches on that. Actually, uh, the LRP paper, which is its co-published paper, touches on that, right? Thinking of this component, right? This is the, let's just say this is the disk management component, right? Does it, does it keep track of who the owner is does it need to keep track of who the owner is? Does it need to know the concept of users at this level? Whoever is implementing the disk management system, right? Does it have to know the concept of owner, process, what have you, or would you want it to do disk writes and reads, right? So if you, the, the uh, algorithm here is, this is the write buffer, right? Anything which is here should be written to the disk, right? Can you implement anything about accounting without telling this stuff something about the notion of processes and threads and all those things? Or put it the other way, in the microkernel, exokernel, the smallest possible mechanism you want, do you just want it to do what it has to do, which is write whatever this was given to wherever it has to go, read whatever was requested back to here, or do you want it to not just keep track of how much resource was consumed to do that, but also have the notion of something which did not, does not have to be along here, which is the notion of process and threads and users and stuff to be able to track it back up, right? That's, that's, that's sort of ties to the, the microkernel stuff, right? Microkernel stuff, we said we should keep all the mechanisms simple, right? So there is no reason why the disk system has to know anything about users and process and all those things because you could have one user who deals with processes, one who deals with threads, or if you use exokernel or microkernel or something, you can have some other completely different stuff. Somebody can be using events, right? So you need to be able to figure out who to charge that who to charge depend, means that I need to now know who these principles are, right? And the principles don't really belong here except for accounting, right? So in the traditional sense, you don't do that. You, you, you kind of ignore those, right? In the traditional operating systems, you ignore that because you just say this is all part of the operating system. This is the operating system overhead. We don't charge it to somebody. And that's not a good thing here, but, but that's what you do. Because if you want to do that, you have to muck around and say, now we have the notion of processes and threads and all those things. So now your operating system becomes really murky because your disk management system now knows about processes and threads and all those things, which it doesn't have to, and it kind of messes up, right? For LRP, what they did was they kind of pushed this notion of a process all the way into the disk subsystem, right? And in this paper, they finally solved the issue of moving all the stuff into the disk subsystem by separating out this notion of resource management into a resource container, right? So at this level, you only charge it to the resource container, not to the user, right? The first step you would do is you bring the notion of a user into the disk management system, which is what they did for the LRP. And that's ugly because now the disk management system knows about stuff it does not have to for anything else except for resource, uh, resource measurement. Then they solve that by saying, okay, so what we really want is we are kind of mixing stuff here. We are kind of mixing the notion of processes and resource management, right? So we should really separate them out. We should really have processes and resource management as a two different concepts. Then all you need to know is this system only has to know about the resource management component, nothing about processes and stuff, right? That's, that's the main thing with this paper. So now they say you have to define so everything you do has to be charged to this resource stuff. It has to be known throughout the operating system, but the operating system does not have to know anything about users or who created it. It has to know that anything it does, it'll charge it to this entity, right? This resource container entity, right? Once you do that, a lot of nice things happen, and that's, that's where the paper comes in. Once you decide to do that, right? So somehow magically you create this resource container. So now I can say anything I want 
would be charged to here. Everything inside the kernel will be accurately charged, should go into this container, right? So if I have that mechanism, then I can put this resource container as per operation, not on per process or threads or whatever, right? And the example they give you is the notion of a file server or any network kind of service, because what happens is if you have a network-based service, right? Yeah, you as an application here, right? it could be a file server, the use of a server or what have you, right? You have some web server here. You have a disk system, you have a network system. Right? This is the disk, and this is the network, right? And somebody makes a request here, right? And this request somehow comes over here, and then it comes, out, it comes to the disk and get the result back, then comes back and goes out, right? If you do the traditional way of doing stuff, Everything has to be charged to the user, which in this case is the process. It gets charged to this process, right? In which case the process, the, so the weird state here is this process is not really servicing any user. This process is serving a bunch of operations, right? So you really would like the management to be done per operation, not per user. Even the, so, the, the packet may come here, go to the network system, go to the user, go to the disk, go back to the here, all those things. If you can charge it all to a single operation, then you can have much more finer grained control. You can say this operation, operation one which is coming through, and operation number two, right? This one is not making too many requests request for resources, right? And this one is very IO intensive. So I can painlist this thing because I know precisely I'm maintaining stuff. So I can say this particular operation is using too many resources, so I can, I can use my policies to be fair. This operation is doing different stuff, and I can be nicer to it because it's playing nice, right? The reason I can do that is I, I can kind of differentiate between this and this, not the, the individual pieces, not that the network system, not that the application, not the stuff, because you can't do that because at the network level, they both look like there's a packet going through, right, for both the requests. At the disk level, they both look like they're going through. At the application level, they both look like they're going through, right? If I use the LRP stuff, I can charge everything which is happening to the disk. I can charge everything happening to the network to the to the uh, uh, application, but it still doesn't solve the problem because basically that means that you're going to see that this application, let's say this is using lots of disk, and this is using zero disk, right? So if you just did LRP, you would look at this uh, process to be using disk and a half worth of stuff. I mean, crudely speaking this by two, right? There are two requests and then one doesn't use anything, right? So you would, you would look at it as doing this kind of half kind of request. And so the operating system has to say, you're using this much disk request, so I'm gonna painless you or whatever. So with the new model, I don't painless application, I painless a particular operation, right? And that's the notion of resource, resource container, right? Does that make sense? It's a powerful mechanism because finally now, I can precisely know what is being charged to who, right? I have a mechanism to, now anything inside the operating system can be charged, right? And charged to the right operation, not to the right process, because process is the wrong model here. They go through a lot of examples to show that you can implement this stuff using processes and threads and what have you, but none of them are really solving the problem because what is really happening is not the mechanism that you use to implement these things, like processes or threads, but the concept that user wanted operation one, operation two, I want you to unify all the stuff, unify all the resource management stuff so that everything gets charged to the particular resource container, which is what they say. So what you want to do is somehow figure out that you're getting a new request, create a resource container, and pass it along with the request. And it has to go through the kernel, so every, everything in the kernel knows about it, right? So when it comes here, whatever it has to do, whatever resource it, it, it has to uh, give, uh, give for this particular stuff, you'll charge it to this. Whatever has to happen here, you charge it. Whatever has to do in the disk, you charge it, so on, right? So you, you create, so somebody has to create all these containers. So if you create the right amount of containers, right, at the earliest point possible, then you win, right? So let's look at what I, what I just said. Why do you need to create lots of resource containers? Is it enough to have one resource container for the whole stuff? Or do you want to create lots of resource container? Lots of connections. 
So you'd want it that are all trying to use the same resource. Mm -hmm. so you'd want to split up that resource between all the different mm -hmm. connections and hence make a resource container for every... Yeah, so you want a resource container per operation, right? Not not per the whole thing, because then it goes back to the, or what you did before. So you want to have one per container. So that, that means you need to create lots of resource containers, right? Um, turns out that's not a good thing, but let's ignore that for a moment, right? So you don't want to create too many of these, because then you could, I mean, then you're passing all this stuff around. And, and, and if you learned anything from the last two lectures, which is we don't want to do too much stuff unless we have to, right? We don't want to create all these containers and lying around in the kernel. So the kernel, you don't want it to be so like keeping track of every resource and assigning it to a bunch of stuff that it can't really do much, right? What's, what's, what, what happens if you have 1,000 resource containers? Why, why would it be so wrong? They, they themselves will take up resources. Like you have to keep track. Mm -hmm. some memories and some so you, you lose memory because now your memory has to hold all this uh, data structure for this resource containers. What else? Think of the decision points. Think of the points where you use this resource containers, right? Resource containers, there are two components. One, when you update this resource container, right, which is where some resource, when something happens, you update it, right? The other component is when you make use, some, use something out of it, right? You have to decide what to do with it, right? So when I'm doing a scheduler, I have to look at the resource container to see which one to go, right? So I have to choose the, the resource container, the next resource, uh, to give the resource to the next entity which has the good resource container, right? So I have to look at all these containers and say, everybody has used a lot of resources except this one container. It hasn't used too many resources. So I want to give my CPU to this container or the thread associated with that container because that's the one which is using less amount of space. Right? So that's the reason why you do this. You want to make a scheduling decision. right? So if you have lots and lots of containers, then the scheduling decision becomes harder and harder. right? So if you have n processes, if you have n processes, right? Scheduling n processes means that I have to go through n process control block to decide which one to run, right? If n process happen to be on the run queue. But if I have resource container, and if the number happens to be n times m, so I'm going to make it correspondingly larger. So the scheduling algorithm becomes complicated because now I have to go through all this list. I have to keep them sorted and, and all those things. So I don't really want that, right? But, but by nature, this whole mechanism cries out for such a long thing because that's the power of this. So you need to somehow figure out how to do this and they don't really uh, address those, right? The other thing is you need to do it as early as possible, right? Not later, right? Why is that? Take this example, right? Should you create the resource container at the point where the network comes in, packet comes in, or uh, the packet point is given to the application, or Whatever. Yeah. You want to do it as early as possible, right? Because you want it to be charged to something, right? If I don't create the resource container here, and I put the resource container stuff here, right? That means the network stuff is completely unmonitored. I Meaning network, network, all the network costs, everybody gets equal share, right? So if I do a denial of service attack, I would still get through all the way, right? And if there are two connections, one for a large file, one for a small file, and I want to give preference to a small file, I can't do that because I don't know that you're part of this resource container till much later, right? So I want to do it as early as possible, right? And that's a little tricky. So I, I, I don't know how much you know about networks, right? So the, the, the key here is the lower you get, the less you know at the application level, right? The lower you get, it's a rub at the, at the extremely lowest end, you, you, it's a bunch of bits, right? The bunch of um, uninterpreted bits, right? And as you move along in the, what they call network stack, right? You begin to get more form. You, you kind of call it Ethernet packet at some point, you call it IP datagram at some point, you call it UDP or TCP datagram at some point. So the higher you go, so at the application level, you deal with TCP, right? Not at the Ethernet level packet or what have you, right? So I don't really know all the stuff till I move further up. 
Because first I need to know whether it's Ethernet packet, then I need to know whether it's IP diagram, then I need to know whether it's a TCP packet, then I need to know who it's destined for, the port number, all those things, right? So that's one challenge. How do I kind of push it all the way down, right? You can't really push it too far down because at, at the lowest level, you're not supposed to know what this packet is about, so you, you will have to drop it sooner. So there's some reason why this, this kind of things can't be too accurate, right? But at some point, you have to decide. So let's say at this point, technically, you could decide, right? Can you do the right decision at this point? Like if this one knows that this packet is going to this application, can it create a resource container for that packet? It, it may involve some amount of networking uh, knowledge, but you really can't because what I mentioned in this two stuff, right? Both these requests are going here, so it has to look into the packet to see who is supposed to do, right? So there's nothing in the packet which says that this is request from somebody to this web page, from somebody else to this web page. You have to look at the URL to figure out which this block is going to and all those things. So it kind of gets pushed up and up, right? Because at this level, it's not supposed to know, it's supposed to know it's going to web server, not that it's coming from a new application or whatever, right? So that's a big challenge. Do you think that the paper addressed that issue of how, where do you create this, this resource container, right? It has to be good, it has to be precise, right? You can't create a resource container for every new packet which comes through, because then you have a whole bunch of stuff, you don't know what is going on, right? You want to associate it with the notion of an operation, right, of some tangible, schedulable stuff. And that some tangible schedulable stuff happens maybe at here, where it's looked at the stuff, so it may be as complicated as it's a web server that you have to log in. So it may, like Google may decide that if you guys log in through Notre Dame, I'm gonna give you better performance, right? So it, it doesn't know that you are from Notre Dame and you're asking a particular Google service till it's come all the way up here and decides to do the stuff. So this part of the networking part is, is not that trivial, right? Now again, the simple solution is to create a resource container for every application which comes through, which is not preferable. The other case is you can create a resource container and as early as possible, and then later on you can kind of combine them to, when you know a little bit more, you can combine and delete them, which also is not preferable because now you're creating a whole bunch of data structure manipulation, right? So they don't exactly talk about that, but that's, that's one thing you run into the problem here. If you want to be, if you want to keep track of every, every resource conception, then it becomes more and more annoying, right? And how do you deal with that is not exactly addressed here because this is the first paper and uh, this is an important part, right? Does that make sense? So another problem, right? What is a resource? I, we gave examples of resource, right? Like CPU and all those things, right? So what is this resource container supposed to account for? How does it, how does it account for stuff? Let's assume that for this request, you created a resource container somehow, and it, it comes here. How much should it charge you? Should it charge you for the amount of CPU time it used for processing your packet, the amount of network network bytes that you got you you uh, you got out of the network card? What is it? What should it charge you for? And how much should it charge it charge you for? If it's a CPU, it can say to process your packet, I took two minutes, right? So I'm going to charge you for two minutes of CPU. If it's going to charge you for network bandwidth, how should it charge you? Should it say, say I charged you for two megabits per se, two megabits and two minutes of CPU? How should it how should it charge? How how did they charge it, and how do you think it should be charged? How, how do you, how do you charge this this stuff? What's the unit of charge? Is what I'm asking. Because you need to know, know the units. Why do you need to know the units actually? Why do you need to know the units? Units. <coughs> the answer is with is why we do this at all, right? We do this because we want to compare two stuff, right? 
we want to know that there is one resource container. There's, so essentially, this is what happens, right? All you're doing this here is you have one resource container with a whole bunch of data and one with a whole bunch of something it ma manipulated. The scheduler has to look at these two and then say which one is, it compares both, right? It's, it tries to look at both and say this is something than this. This is better than this, this is faster than this, or something, right? Because if you don't do that, then there's no point in doing the whole stuff. You're, you're trying to make a decision, right? You're trying to de decide that this is a resource that needs to be maintained. So I need to know, compare them, right? So to compare them, I need to know the units that these things are, right? So if you, if you wrote down and said, I used 22 CPU, one net, and 1.5 disk, and this one used four CPU, zero net, zero disk. I'm just throwing some numbers, right? So how do you know, what do you do with this then? If you can't see the numbers in the back, you know, the number is not important, but the, but the point is, there are two different, uh, two different sets of values, right? They didn't, they didn't explicitly state that in this paper, because it, it's kind of assumed that you, I guess you're supposed to know or something, right? How, how would you do this? Yeah, you the, you do what typically you do in operating system, right? Which is you use heuristics, right? You kind of say, well, I'm going to call CPU is more important for me, and network is not that important, and disk is not that important. So I'm going to have some weights to convert all these numbers that you have into one number, right? So some through some operation that I I do. I convert this into X, and through some operation I do, I convert this into Y, and hopefully I can compare X and Y. I say if I say if X is more than Y, then something, and if X is less than Y, I do something, right? So there's another magic here, right? How you come up with that number is, is very hard, and I don't think anybody has figured out how to do that, right? In fact, this is one thing that we've, that we've been doing in operating systems all along, and we never quite know how to do that. Right? If you think about it, operating system scheduling decides these things all the time. Maybe not explicitly, maybe not like doing all the stuff, but it's deciding that two, one of the processes have to run, right? So can you name a policy where you have two processes and you decide to run one or the other? Can you name one policy of which one to prefer? You can use undergrad operating system class as an example because that's one thing that we, we stress, right? What is one heuristic that you use to figure out which process to run? There are two processes. Hmm? Sorry? Uh, round robin. Round robin, right? Uh, okay, yeah, round robin, I don't look at who you are. I just, I just pick one uh, based on where you've been, right? Um, something else where I have to look at the process, right? Yeah, so the, all the variants, right? shortest job first and all those things, you kind of look at something about what, how much you use or how much you're going to use, what have you, and then I decide, right? So there you're making an assumption that shortest job, the shortest CPU time is somehow more valuable than shortest disk first, right? Have, you, have any of you looked at shortest disk first or shortest network time first policies? You probably shouldn't have. I mean, I, I never heard of those, right? Because implicit assumption here is CPU is somewhat more valuable. So you look at the CPU cost more than some other cost, right? So this problem is always there. We just never talk about it. We just kind of hide it under the, under the rug and we just say, CPU is the most important stuff. Deal with it. That's, that's the one we have to look at. So we look at this, how much CPU are you using? If you're using too much CPU, you do something. Too little CPU, you do something else, right? And that's not all, always true, especially since processors are getting faster and faster and cheaper and cheaper, especially in these cases because the example they were giving, the CPU is not really doing much. It's basically, especially in the static web page, it gets some network packet, it reads some disk block, it sends it out. So it's not doing too much CPU. So you, now you're forced 
to kind of differentiate between these two, right? And we never knew how to do this, as far as I know, all the time. Because we have heuristics, you know, some, you can say, I think the best thing is to have CPU at certain percentage and all those things, but that's one thing you need to solve, right? Because if you don't have this metric, then this whole thing kind of falls apart, because I need to know how, how much to charge. So this has to know how much to charge you, right? So I need to have this notion of resource. If I have a notion of resource, if I kind of define what it is, now everybody along can make, everybody who may use a resource knows how to charge you, and everybody who makes a decision knows how to compare the stuff, right? And if you can kind of push it all the way to the, end, to the lowest point, so now it's doing it based on operations, not based on any other abstractions which are useful in other contexts. It's based on what the user really wants. So with this system, if you can build it, it can give you quality of service to the web server. It can make sure that one web request goes through faster than the other one. It can make quality of service for your file server. It can do all kind of stuff, right? So do you buy, do you buy this argument? Do you think it's an important tool? So I think many of you mentioned that they haven't mentioned anything other than the server, right? Which is to be understood because you know you want one of the things you learn actually you, um, even in the homework assignment and stuff, right? You don't answer stuff that you're not really confident and you're kind of doing the stuff because you only get into trouble, right? So. Um, in the case of a homework assignment, if I ask you about exokernel, if you go off on a tangent and, and, and give a one-page spiel on what do you think of microkernels, right? And uh, suppose through that you expose that you, you didn't know some concept, right? Then I'm going to actually be hard on you even though you don't have to kind of that, right? So in the papers, you never say some things that you don't have to. I mean, you just stay with what you have to do, right? Let's think about uh, from, from our perspective. Can you think of what else you can benefit from this notion. Um, so clearly the case of web server and file server all fall into this kind of a mode, right? Does it apply to other kind of stuff, other kind of applications? Yeah? I guess a database system. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. so, so, so explain more on what, what's a database, how is it a database system? I guess you could think of it as charging if you had multiple departments of users using mm -hmm. running queries or something. You could charge each user for the amount of mm -hmm. resources they use to generate their query. Or mm -hmm. So you can do put a resource container based on a query, not on a, on the resource on the on the. So in that case, the the query is the operation, right? So you have to charge it to the appropriate query, right? And somehow you figure out how to uh, unify these resources, so you know how to do that, right? How many, so how, how many of you know about databases more than they exist? How many of you taken a course in databases? Um, so I can't really go too far into it. I'll just give a hint, right? So one of the things that you do in databases is you optimize stuff, right? So if, if he comes and asks, uh, give me all the students who are registered in operating system class, I have to do some, <coughs> some amount of work and I need to charge him. And if somebody else comes and asks, give me all the students who are taking this class and who are male, right? You do a joint query, right? So you, you kind of have the original results and you can optimize it to, rather than look at all the students, you can say the new query is a subquery of this one, so I can, I can do the joint query on the results, right? So if, you, so if somebody else comes and says, you know, how many are, are women, then you can do this options, right? So when you do those things, I think somebody brought it up in, in the OS context, right? So what do you do? Do you, how do I, so should he be charged? So he asked for all the students in this class and you asked for all the students in this class who are male. And so should I, how much should I charge both? Right? Should I charge you guys both the whole, in, you know, whole query for him and the whole query for you? Or should I charge, should I give you guys the benefit that you guys came together? Um, or not, right? It seems like you would want to give the benefit that you guys lucked out and you, you, you should be given the stuff, right? But it's not that trivial, depending on how low you want to go, right? And that brings up another issue with this whole mechanism, right? Should you go all the way down to every little thing that you ask for, or should I be generally 
kind of giving you stuff, right? Should I go all the way down and say, how many disk blocks did you read? Right? Because, it, like, let's say disk, right? The cost of reading a disk block is, what's the cost of reading a disk block? What is the time, let's say in time, right? What is the time, how much time does it take to read a disk block? What are the components of a disk block read? Yeah, seek time, rotational latency, and transfer time, right? Seek time is, so if you have a disk here, um, refresh, you know, the you have a disk platter, and these are different tracks, so if you're here, so if the disk head is here, seek time is the time it takes to go to the appropriate track, and rotational latency is the time it takes for the, for the platter to rotate around, to come under you, and transfer time is the actual time to read the stuff, right? So you pay the cost to go move your head from here to the right track, you pay the cost for the thing to, uh, you know, rotate under, under you, and then you take the time to read the stuff, right? So you have these three costs, it adds time, right? So if I go all the way low, if I wanna look at every little thing, right? Then if I have two requests and I have to go somewhere else, so his request made me go all the way to, to here, right? And then your request comes and your request happens to be here, right? So I was here, Let's say I was here in the innermost track, and his request made me go all the way to the outermost track, and your request made me go all the way to the innermost track, right? But if he was not there, I would have probably gone from the innermost to your track, as it was closer, right? So should he be penalized because he was there? I mean, it's good if you can benefit from what he does, right? Should I go all the way down and look at all the stuff, right? Um, so you're saying no, right? Is that a no all the time, or is it, it depends? I think, yeah. Well, you don't necessarily know that. In regards to the disk, then you may use as many resources tracking that as Mm -hmm. it yeah, yeah, it's not practical too because you know you have to keep track of all. I mean, you're you're gonna you're gonna spend CPU time trying to to get all those stuff, right? So you don't. Re, I, I don't see. I don't think that you want to go too far and start to account for everything because now you're gonna spend effort doing that. And also it gets out of hand. At some point you have to say, well, you have to buy into this notion that everything has to be more fine-grained, but not at the level of that, right? You, you, you have to let it go because it opens some more can of worms than you really want to deal with, right? So you kind of average out and you kind of say charge it for the number of bytes, not necessarily going all the way, right? Because that makes the, the whole thing um, more more complicated, right? Um, so for, for this to work, if you can do all the stuff, right? This is a fantastic scheme, right? Now I can, yeah, like the database case you said, database case is a little bit easier because the query processor itself knows what the operations are. So it can say anything you do for this particular query, charge it to this query, and I can give you better quality of service, right? So this is a quality of service that the operating system understands more than what the database can understand because they both collaborate with each other, right? And so, a database is one, one operation. What other thing can you imagine um, besides the, database is good because let's assume it's not a network database, right? So this is query created by the user and it only deals with the file system, not the network system, so it's, it's nicer. Can you think of another application? Can you think of any random application, right? Does it, would it help your web browser? Would your web browser benefit from being treated as a resource container rather than as an application? Or your word processor, like your word. So you have to assume something which needs multiple operations, right? So let's assume your word processor will do spell check and grammar check while you're doing something, right? So there's, there's something checking your spelling and the grammar all while you're typing, right? So do you want this notion of a resource container in that sense, or do you want all of them treated as the same application, right? I think, I think when you go into more threaded programs, you, you are gonna run into applications where sometimes they're all part of the same operation, sometimes they're part of different operations, and you want them to be treated differently, right? And I think, I mean, obviously I have no data to back this up, but in the word case, I assume that 
the grammar check and the spell check and my typing, I want them to be treated differently, right? Because I may want to decide that the spell check and grammar check is not that important, right? So if the CPU has to, can only give me a certain amount of resources, I want it to go to my typing operation, not to my spell check operation, right? So one way to do that is if I can expose my operations to the operating system, which is what I'm trying to do here, then I can say my typing should go through regardless of what. The spell check and the, and the other stuff don't have, I mean, they can, they can live with whatever uh, was left over because they are, they are background operation, right? So, so I think this is applicable for a whole bunch of stuff. Anything where you can think of multiple threads doing, multiple threads or multiple, multiple entities working on your behalf, right? Having this would be a better way of organizing stuff from the application perspective rather than on threads or, or what have you, right? I'm gonna give examples where you can have the stuff pass through multiple different applications. You want the, the resource container to go past those, right? So in this case, here you may call a database server to get something from your web server, right? You still want to keep this association. You still want to say this particular stuff was sent from, you know, came from this network stack, went to this web server, now went to this database server. So within this database server, give it the same priority, and it may go to the disk and all those things. So you want it to go across the system, right? The other, okay, so another one, which they, they say we don't have time to look at it because we don't have space, uh, space and stuff, right? What about security? What are the security issues? Um, not security and encryption and all those things, but like what, what are the issues with using this stuff? I mean, yeah. it's really dangerous if application can go and modify, you know, all the parameters inside the container mm -hmm. to give it, you know, the higher priority than the application. So how do you do that? Give it some kind of access control list of which applications can, are allowed to modify its parameters. So who would, uh, so access control list means somebody has to monitor it, right? Somebody has to make sure that, somebody has to enforce the access control, right? Who would do it? <coughs> so at this point, you, we're running into a problem which we've been kind of harping over for the last few lectures, right? What is the problem you run into if you're kind of this involved? Yeah, you, you don't want to go to the kernel, right? The context switch is we don't, it's not our friend, right? Right? You, you guys agree, right? If you want, if you want to have some kind of a security features on it, right? So the the idea here is, I want everybody should be able to create one, right? Which is trivial. I can I can let anyone create it, but you don't want too many to be created. So I want to be able to create, do some things. I want to be able to assign somebody a, a resource container, I want to be able to take some resource container, I want to be able to modify something in the resource container, right? So, and it, it goes between the kernel and forth because the way you have it, it comes, you know, it creates the stuff and it, it follows you around wherever you go, right? So, somebody has to modify it. So, the, at the application level, if he has to do something, if he has to pass it around and stuff, right? You want to have some kind of protection mechanism which say that only kernel should be able to modify it, or only somebody else should be able to modify it, right? only the authorized person, right? And the way we traditionally do that is through system calls, or the kernel getting involved with the stuff, right? You know what I'm talking about, like the, the one section where they said, you know, the secure aspects, it's, it's not, we're not gonna talk about it in this paper. They made it sound like they have a solution which they were not gonna explain in this paper because they didn't have enough space, right? I looked at the code for this particular stuff, they don't, right? But I think it's a very complicated stuff to deal with, right? It's not very trivial to do that because you have to keep track of all the stuff, right? Um, to me, this sounds like the, the, the sort of thing that um, you do with the credit card, credit card processing and how you add the data, right? So how much you add money to the credit card stuff, you can ask a central server to make sure that everything is um, done properly, right? and that you get a performance hit. But if I let you modify the number, right, many people don't believe that. If I, if I let you give you the privilege to modify your debit card balance, right, 
many people don't trust it because you can modify it, right? So to make it, to protect it, I need somebody who's trusted. That means it has to go somewhere. In the case of credit cards, you go to a central server. In the case of here, you go to the kernel, and you solve that problem, then you get another problem. Now you have a lot more system calls, a lot more stuff going on because of this, right? So all the six stuff you built in here now has to be, don't do too much of it because the kernel, uh, right, we have to find a balance for, for that too, right? So there's, I think there's some some problems which are unsolved that they don't kind of uh, mention it, but I think they're serious problems, right? One is security, right? What's other problem that we discussed that is still open in this issue in in the, in the system? Efficiency. What do you mean by efficiency? Or just uh, you know. Yeah, the cost, cost versus benefit, right? <laughs> I think the cost also means that the more you do, the more fine-grained you go, the cost goes up, right? So, and at some point you have to d balance this out. So you don't do too much, but you still get the benefit of the stuff, right? The, the third one is the notion of the unification, right? How do you create, how do you unify all the um, metrics, right? How do you unify all the metrics to come up with one number that you use to, con how, how, can I, how can I charge you in one simple unit rather than all this different stuff, right? So what does a network resource mean? What does a disk resource mean? What does a CPU resource mean, right? We didn't run into the problem before because the CPU scheduler only looked at the CPU and not CPU, right? If you're not scheduled, it assumes it's I.O., so it either looks at you as how much CPU you use, how much CPU you didn't use to schedule you. But now that it has all these numbers, it has to figure out how to unify this stuff, right? So, and, and the last one, what happens if you have unify me metric? Cost versus benefit. So the, um, the last one is, what happens if you put this in a general purpose operating system, right? The example they had here was a file web server, and all the web server was doing was servicing users, right? So, you, so let's, say, let's say you decide that disk is blah, network is foo, and CPU is something, right? So this web server machine can be, can potentially be made really good, right? Let's, let's assume, I, I, think, I think the approach is great. I mean, I think we can use this approach to solve the web server problem. Right, with some minor caveats. We can solve the web server to solve the database uh, problem, right? What happens if you have both of them operating on the same machine? Does it, does it cause problems or does it make, what, what, what are we trying to achieve in that case, right? Let's assume that we have database server and the web server on the same machine. What, is, what would be our goal in your case, you explained that you know certain queries should go better, and now you have the other policy that certain web requests should go better, right? And they all translate into disk and network and CPU resources, right? I mean, all the your notion of web server and all those things, as you go lower, it's network packets and disk blocks and stuff, right? How do you interleave these two metrics from two different application perspective, right? Be some policy in some other resource containers to show that there's some quality service between the database and the web server, and mm -hmm. how they should operate together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, so um, would that be an easy policy to define, create? Probably not. I mean, we have to observe the behavior and see mm -hmm. what, was, what worked. Mm -hmm. I would acceptable service. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 I think I, I don't think it's any more uh, harder than unifying these metrics, right? You have to come up with some metrics to say something works or something, right? Um, so there are a lot of problems like that with this approach, but I like this approach because I think I think this is this is one of the the first stuff, first papers in this in this notion of describing that you know processes and and threads are. Um, are good for some things, right? But they're not a good thing for managing resources 
because the processes do multiple stuff, right? Yeah. So they talked about the QoS, the quality of service, mm -hmm. how implement that. Mm -hmm. So doesn't it, isn't it a type of the second one, like cost versus benefit from the user's perspective? Mm -hmm. um, QoS is, quality of service is one thing that this whole thing is designed to do, right? If you didn't, so the reason why we do all this stuff is because of the quality of service, right? Which means that, so you want to do equally well to everybody, right? Whatever that equally well is, then the status quo works, right? If you're, if you're just going to do a round robin kind of stuff, the status kind of works, right? If I want to do something different, I need to know who's good, who's bad, and that's why I'm trying to come up here, right? So you need to do quality of service, but this notion of cost versus benefit is more, uh, my understanding was, I can go, I can, I can take it all the way to the limit to, to measure every resource that you're using, but if I do too, too much, then the cost of doing that, right? I need to calculate every operation needs to be accounted for, you need to have storage and all those things, so at some point you have to decide that you don't want all that all the details, right? Um, no, I mean, the, the, all these follow under the notion of a quality of service, right? Which, the networking sense, they have a much stronger design, you know, notion of what quality of service is, but in, in, in operating system parlance, I think most, most stuff that you do is based on some notion of a quality of service. You want to differentiate between some, one thing or the other for whatever reason, and this is making it even uh, nicer to do, right? Well, from an OS perspective, this, the scheduling is basically a quirky OS thing, right? But now we are assigning it to the right operation, right? Right? So th th that's the nice thing about the paper. This is one of the first papers which kind of talked about this in, in, this, in, in this kind of a fashion. It, uh, it, 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 it opened a whole bunch of stuff that we don't know how to deal with, right? Um, the other stuff that uh, we didn't add here was, how to do it as early as possible, right? And that's not necessarily easy because you need to figure out who, you know, who it belongs to. Like in the network case, it's even more uh, possible, right? Because you don't know who it belongs to and all those things, and that's a problem, right? So going beyond this paper, um, so we were looking at this for other scenarios and stuff, right? So one of the one of the scenario was. Um, I think they, they mentioned it a little bit in this paper, right? Which is a denial of service, right? So what's the denial of service? Uh, what what does denial of service and why does it, why do they talk about it in this paper? I don't know if you, how many of you taken uh, networking kind of uh, courses, right? So in, in networking kind of courses, my idea is I want me as the bad guy, let's say there are two bad guys here, and our goal is to make sure that this good guy um, trying to, let's say, talk to another good guy, right? I want to prevent that from happening. I don't want the two good people to be talking, right? So my goal is to deny you from talking to that one, right? And I can do whatever I want to make sure that that doesn't happen, right? That's, I would argue, is like the, 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 the high-level idea of what denial service is. And one of the ways I do that is, I mean, I can cut this cable, right? That's one way to do that. But let's assume that I don't have physical access. I can't cut the cable and stuff, right? So instead, what I do is I make this do stuff for me, right? I resource deplete this, right? I resource deplete this one. So this can no longer talk to there because it does not have resources to talk to that one, right? So the way I do that is I, I also talk. <laughs> this person also talks, right? If all three of us are talking to a server, and if you're having a conversation, let's say we are able to maintain a conversation, that means you only have one third resource to talk to that one, to, to that node, right? So, that's, that's, so it cuts down on how much resource can be given to that particular node, right? So the other case is if you don't know how to maintain a conversation, I start a conversation, right? And let you use resources. So I can just initiate a conversation, you say, oh no, go away, right? So I think of this as, one way to prevent me from talking to your significant other on the phone is for me to keep calling you, right? And I don't have to do anything, I don't have to talk to you, I don't have to hold a conversation, but the fact that I'm calling you means that you are, you're, you're being bombarded, your lines, line, lines are being held and all those things, so that's what I can do. I can start a conversation and 
which is clearly bogus. If you pick up the phone, you know it's not who you want to talk to. But the fact that I'm calling you is the thing. So I open connections. And it's made easier by having lots 